I'm going to start by lowering your expectations of what I'm going to say. Um, I, I'm actually going to talk a lot about some of the specifics and a specific example of what George was talking about, about the power of data, about using existing technologies um, to do a better job of patient care. My uh, other colleagues on the panel have some really cool, nifty things that is going to be much more exciting to look at. Um, so I want to lower your expectations. It will get better as you go down the panel. Um, <laughs> Uh, my slides are on here, and I didn't know, but George did a fabulous job of setting me up. That's the last one. Uh, is there a clicker? Because I actually, I, I can just, I can, I can stand here and do this. That's fine. Not a problem. I'm fine. As, as the CEO of a startup company, you learn to be adaptable. Um, so this graph is the one that describes why we need better diagnostics. The last 30 years of innovation in the healthcare field have primarily been in the drug and the device side. So we have great products, both drugs and devices, that are available to many of us around the world. They solve people's problems every day. They cure people's ills every day. They keep people alive every day. But the challenge is each one of those is much more expensive than what it replaced. And so what we haven't done is we haven't gotten to the do, 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 okay. That one, that one. That one? That one? No, that's fine. That's perfect. That's right where I am. That's right where I am. Um, so what we haven't done is we've got all these new expensive drugs and devices, but we haven't invested in the diagnostics to make sure we're getting the right drug and the right device to the right patient at the right time. You know, we talk about the fact that we practice medicine. That verb is much too accurate. We don't have it right. You know, we've been very willing to have trial and error medicine. Oh, we'll try this, and if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. You wouldn't put up with that from your auto mechanic, but you're willing to put up with it from your doctor. And we've got to change that mindset. Next slide, please. Um, let me give you an example that we saw in the US, and this is really what drove our, our, our product concept. Um, so if you have chest pain, and this is stable chest pain, so you're shoveling snow, walking the dog at the gym, um, and you get this pain that comes when you're exercising but goes away. That's called stable chest pain. And almost three and a half million people in the U.S. show up at their doctor's office complaining of chest pain. As you can imagine, when you get chest pain, the first thing that you think about is, oh, there's something wrong with my heart. Am I about to have a heart attack? And so the reaction for the physician is to send you down a pathway that is trying to figure out whether you've got a blockage in one of your coronary arteries. And yet we know from lots of data that 90% of the time that's not true. That's not what's causing your chest pain. And so what this says is we looked at 400,000 people in the U.S. And when they go to the cath lab, it's when you have this chest pain and you go to the cardiologist, they give you an imaging scan that is lots of fun. They shoot you full of radioactive dye and then they put a gamma camera on top of you and it's about 700 times a normal chest x-ray. It's just lots of fun. You get to be away from work for a day or two. Um, and if you have a positive stress test, then they send you to the cath lab and they stick a wire up your femoral artery and they stick it in your heart and do all kinds of fun things. Um, so we do this and only 38% of the time do we get it right. So over 60% of the time, people that go to the cath lab, we don't get it right. If you're a woman in this room, take that 38% and call it 18%. Less than 20% of the women that go to the cath lab in the U.S. with stable chest pain do not need to be there. So that's the problem. We have technologies, we're not using them appropriately because we're not getting the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. Next slide, please. This is working now, thank yeah. you. Um, so let me describe how the, a patient flow works. And this is true in the US, it's true in Canada, it's true in the UK, UAE, it doesn't matter where you are. So uh, these are US numbers though. Three, three and a half million patients with stable chest pain show up in their doctor's office every year. That's about 10,000 patients a day. They usually show up in a primary care office, and the tools that the primary care physician has are pretty minimal. You'll see a really cool way to fix that in a, little, in a few minutes here. But they get an EKG and they get clinical factors, what your parents die from, all those kinds of things. And their decision that they're trying to make is, do I keep this patient here and look for some other reason? Because the other reasons that you could be having chest pain are you could have muscle spasms, it could be anxiety, you could have had a bad Chinese meal last night. It could be that, uh, that, that simple. They're trying to decide, do I send that patient on to the cardiologist to really find out whether this chest pain is due to something wrong in their heart? 
Some patients come directly to cardiology, and the decision the cardiologist is trying to make, do I send this person to the cath lab? Because the cath lab is the ultimate arbiter of whether you have enough disease. So if, if this is your coronary artery, if it's blocked by at least 60%, so if there's a 60% blockage, that warrants putting one of these metal stents in and opening it back up. It's a plumbing problem, basically, and we can fix the plumbing problem. Um, so this is the process we go through, and the cardiologist has a few more tools that they can utilize. Um, and we spend about $5 billion in the U.S. on getting this. So if we spent $5 billion, I would certainly hope we would be better than 38% of the time, but we're not. So that's what we've developed. We've developed a test called Core CAD that's used both in primary care and in cardiology to determine what should this patient do next. Should they go left out of the door or right out of the door? The trouble is left out of the door to cardiology is much more expensive. So any patients that we can keep from going left is better. Okay. Um, let me just quickly show you how it works. So this is a blood test. So up here we patient and the physician get together, doctor decides they want to order the test, they draw about two teaspoons of blood into a tube. This is gene expression, this is genomics, this is not genetics that you inherited from your parents, this is which genes are turned on and which are turned off in your body at any given time. So that, um, that tube gets in a box, and my little link is not working anymore, uh, there it goes. Um, we put it in a, in, a, in a FedEx plane, it comes back to our office in California, um, we synthesize the cDNA, excuse me, we synthesize the RNA, we synthesize the cDNA, and then we put it on RTCPR machines. Lots of initials, but basically we're looking of those 23 genes plus age and gender that's in our algorithm, which are turned on and which are turned off, or which are turned more on and more off, and we're not looking for big changes. They're, they're ve biology is very subtle. We're looking for changes that are 1.2, 1.3 times low versus high, or on versus off. So it's very subtle changes. We do all that and we give the physician back um, the result. And what we give them is a score from 1 to 40 that says what's the probability this patient has obstructive coronary disease. And the reason that's important is because if it's a low score and a low probability, that physician is comfortable saying, I'm not going to send you to cardiology, I'm not going to send you to the cath lab, I'm going to keep you here and figure out what's the other reason for your chest pain. Your chest pain's real. Most of the time, you would be surprised how many physicians tell us that once they run our test and the score is low, the symptoms have gone away. Um, so that's, that, that, that's part of it as well. So this is a process to give you a little sense of the company. I founded the company in 2005. Um, we spent the first two years sort of walking in the forest, sort of. We had three things we were interested in doing. We had to figure out which was the right one to do first. We decided in early 2007 to launch our coronary disease program. To George's comments, in our big clinical trial that we started in June of 2007, we were on the market in June of 2009. So two years from first patient in to product on the market. That's two decades in the pharmaceutical world often. Okay, we've run 30,000 tests to date. Um, we are in the US only. I came a few days early here to figure out how we maybe go to the UK um, and some other emerging markets. Uh, we've got about 100 people in the company today. This is an enormous market opportunity. We've wanted to keep the test volume as low as possible. This is one of the challenges that we have in the U.S. The physicians will use it, but the insurance companies won't pay for it. Um, so we've run 30,000 tests for free, basically, um, because you have to generate the data for the insurance companies to pay for it, and we're right on the cusp of that. We just got Medicare, the, the U.S. government um, payment system, to pay for it earlier this year. So with that, I'm going to stop. Um, and happy to take your questions later on. David, fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you.